Amen. <clears throat> Welcome to Growing in God, St. Frederick's Baptist Church here in Marble Falls, where Reverend George H. Perry is the pastor, who is celebrating a special day today being his birthday. Join me in wishing Pastor Perry a happy birthday. And I am uh, Dennis Porter. I am your course facilitator tonight, and we will be coming from Isaiah 52.13 to 53.12, the burning heart scripture. Let us go to our Father in prayer. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. Most High God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the Creator of the heavens and the earth and the forms thereof, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all there is, all there was, all there will be, the Almighty. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the one that knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb. The giver of all good and perfect gifts. Father, first, we ask you to shine your face upon us so that we may be saved. Father, forgive us for we've all fallen short of your will and your glory. But Father, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you for your son, Jesus, that went to the cross and shed his blood for the remission of our sin and salvation of our soul. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and communion with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, Father. Father, we thank you for the angels that watch over us, the archangels, the guardian angels, the ministering angels, the health angels, all the angels that watch over us each and every day. Now, Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love, your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, joy, peace, and purity, courage, healing, and strength, abundance, awareness, and expansion. Father, we thank you for unity. Now, Father, we ask that you touch each and every heart tonight that's part of this lesson. Touch their hearts, their souls, their minds. Father, speak to me, speak through me. Remove my ego and let your word go forth and penetrate our hearts tonight, Father. Teach me, teach us, that we may grow closer to you. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. Let's talk about devotion. A starving mother literally gives herself to the child that she nurses. A nursing mother. And this is kind of befitting the occasion. As coming up here real soon, we'll be celebrating mothers. Now we know that a mother that truly loves her child will sacrifice any and everything that she has for that child. And the opening line, devotion. A starving mother, mother literally gives herself to the child that she is nursing. Then let's talk about self-sacrifice. Maximilian Kolbe, a Catholic priest, takes the place of a family man in a punishment cell of a Nazi concentration camp and starves to death. Each one of these situations we're looking at and talking about taking away from ourselves to ensure someone else lives and survives. Taking away from ourselves so that someone else can live and survive. What about stories like these that makes us feel some kind of way. Why does these stories tug at our heartstrings, make us emotional? Why do they make us feel the way they make us feel? I would suggest this because we all want to feel that someone loves us and cares enough for us to sacrifice for us. And I believe 
And I hope, for the most part, at least for this family, we have that feeling that when necessary, we would show that type of devotion and to a degree that sacrifice, self-sacrifice. And it's something that we may or may not want to be reciprocated, but we know that it is there and we can exactly, Evangelist Kennedy, we can relate to him. We can relate to him. As a mother, I know you can relate much better than I ever will. Because as a father, you know, to me, you either you get it or you don't. And that's not always the right way. I can be patient. I can be nurturing. And then again, sometimes it's like, boy, you got to make it. The world is not going to be kind to you. You got to learn how to make it. Amen. We can relate to them. So, then take time to think about a time that somebody has suffered for you. And what do you think the experience of suffering was like? When I think about suffering for me, I think about when I was nine years old, I got hit by a car. When I was 12, my appendix ruptured. And I know those weren't easy days for my mother. So I believe, you know, now that I've had a chance to grow up, that there was some suffering because she was worried about me. There was some suffering because she had to give up some things, some time to come and see about me when I was in the hospital. When I got hit by that car, I was in the hospital for a week. So that meant a week that she had to change everything that she had going on, taking care of my little brother, taking care of the house, and managing things that she was managing to come care and take care of me. When I was two, I broke my legs. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had my leg broke, my arm broke. It looked like a mummy. And then when my appendix was out, I was in the hospital for two weeks. So that meant going all the way from the south suburbs to the west side of Chicago. She had to sacrifice time to get there. And then once being there, had to see me look with tubes running all over everything. You know, before, this was before they had all the modern techniques that they have now. Tubes out my nose, tubes here, tubes there. And see that. And I know that, that had to be agonizing. That had to be agonizing. So, <clears throat> there's a rising tide of expectancy and excitement in Isaiah 51 and 52. As the time for the Jews' release from captivity draws near. In Isaiah 51, 9 through 11, records a prayer for God to act and pictures of exiles coming home to Zion crowned with never fading gladness. Then in 52 and 1, Jerusalem is told to awake and arise from the dust. Why? Arana is approaching over the mountains with good news. God is about to deliver his people. It's time to leave Babylon. In this passage, we are introduced again to the servant of the Lord, whose solitary agony is the price of his people's homecoming. Let's take a read. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. And many were astonished at you. His appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he sprinkled many, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths before him, for that which has not been told them they see. 
and that which they have not heard, they understand. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form, no majesty that we should look at, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from men whom men hid their faces, he was despised and he was esteemed not. Surely he was born, our, he, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep before his shearer is silent. He opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation whom considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The Lord and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with, our transgression, with the transgressions, yet bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Well, the burning hard scripture. So we look at this section of Isaiah. The servant song. We are on holy ground. The following verses testify to the coming suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his exaltation and universal recognition as Lord is still future, but in God's eternal plan, is already done. The Gentile nations will see Christ in his glory, and they will be speechless. So none of this has happened for us to see it, but yet since God has spoken, it, it's done. He spoke word for word, that prophet Isaiah spoke word for word what was going to happen. And later on in the lesson, we'll see where we find everything that was prophesied that did take place. The great sin of Israel leaders and people was their failure to recognize their Messiah when he came. A relative few in Israel believed. Not much different from today. We know the Messiah is coming. The Messiah coming is preached all over the world, yet we have a whole lot of different people that just believe in themselves. They believe in nothing. Or they chose another deity, another God to worship. Whether it be Buddha, 
Muhammad, their car, their job, or whatever it is. They've chosen something else to worship and believe in rather than believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the one that was born out of dry land, the one that had no form, no majesty, the one that was marred beyond recognition, then we were all astonished and we were all trying to figure out why would somebody do what he did. Most of the Jews in Jesus' day, though, didn't even regard him as a person of importance. Oh, that's just Joseph's son. He's a compliment. He ain't nobody. I'm pretty sure from time to time we've all heard that mention about us one way or another. Not to put us on the same level with Jesus Christ, but we are heirs with Jesus Christ, and people look at us because we believe in Jesus Christ and dismiss us. Oh, he ain't nobody. She ain't nobody. And that's just how they treated him. He was nobody. There was nothing impressive about his physical appearance. He was despised and he was rejected. They hated him and told him to get lost. Go on somewhere, get away from us. The people turned away from him and his suffering. Oh, this is that dude on the cross. Give us Barabbas. We have no king but Caesar. These are the things that they said when he was pierced in his side and the blood came streaming down. But God also makes clear through Isaiah the reason the servant Messiah would die was because of our rebellion, because of our iniquities. The Lord punished him for the iniquity of all of us. In other words, we couldn't take what he took. And we know that back in that time, there had to be a blood sacrifice. And the only way for that blood sacrifice to be sufficient, God had to separate himself. Sacrifice himself in order to satisfy himself. Hundreds of years before this happened, the prophet testified to the substitutionary atonement of Christ being on the cross. In other words, substitutionary means instead of us paying the price, Jesus paid the price. That is the doctrine of substitution. We were unable to pay the price, so Jesus paid for us. Or in other words, we got credit that we didn't deserve. Or to make it simple, it's a five-letter word, grace. Although he died for sinners, it is clear that the Messiah himself is innocent. Okay, nobody named anything that Jesus did wrong. There's nothing that he did. He sinned against nobody. He had done no violence except when he threw the folks out the temple. And they deserve to be thrown out the temple. When you desecrate the Father's house, where well, you get the punishment that comes along with it. He never lied on nobody. Everything he said, he said was the truth. How can God lie? He is God, so therefore he cannot lie. He can only speak the truth. Jesus was tried, condemned, and led away by wicked people who had a clearly miscarried justice. But the innocent one had to die for the righteous, for the righteous of the unrighteous because of the people's rebellion. In other words, there had to be something pure Somebody pure, the blood had to be pure in order to cleanse everything that was nasty. Simplest way I could put it. And because their hearts were full of wickedness, disbelief, and rebellion, the only way it could be done was through Christ's blood. Again, the accuracy of the details provided are draw, are draw dropping. For example, example. Like a sheep silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. He was led from judgment hall to judgment hall, never said a mumbling word. When Pilate questioned him, he said, that's what you say. He never declared anything. He never argued with them. He could have called legions of angels to come down, but he didn't. He was like a sheep that's put up on the lamp on the block to have his fur cut off, and he did not say a word. The gospel writers testified to Jesus' silence before those who falsely accused him. 
Also, he was with the rich man at his death. Matthew tells us the rich man from Amaritha was named Joseph. Asked Pilate for Jesus' body and buried him in, a, in his own tomb. The fulfillment of those prophecies is the testimony to the divine inspiration and truthfulness of the Bible. In other words, everything that was said that was going to happen, happened and played out just like God said it would play out. The Father and the Son had been in loving communion from the eternity past, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Why? Why would he do God's will? Amen. That's why he was pleased to crush him. Because his son's death was a guilt offering. In reference to the Old Testament sacrifices for sin, only was the only way to go about bringing our salvation. God gave his one and only son because he loved the world. Nowhere, nowhere is the amazing love of God for unworthy sinners on full display like in the cross of Jesus Christ. Think about for yourself for a minute. When you give up something that is precious to you, how do you feel? If it's going to make someone better, how does it make you feel? If it can draw those that you love to you closer, how do you feel? See, in my mind's eye right now, I can see God being pleased with Jesus dying on the cross because he was going to draw the believers, the ones that believed that Christ was, Jesus, Christ was God incarnate and that he rose again. He knows that those who are going to come closer to him and they were going to call on his name. They were going to believe in him. They are going to trust in him and they're going to know that he is who he say he is. And through the death of the righteous servant, he would justify men. We are part of the men. Not just, not just that day. Not just those ones that day, but us. And if there's generations after us, they have. You feel a great loss, but it's good to help somebody. And the generations to come have the opportunity to receive redemption just by believing that Jesus Christ died and rose again for our sins. Isaiah didn't stop there. Because of the obedience of the servant Messiah, God does not abandon him in the grave. No, 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 no. Because of the obedience of Jesus Christ, he went to the cross, he died. And after he died, he went down to the nether parts of the world and he took the sting out of death and he took the keys to the kingdom of hell. Now death can't keep me and hell can't hold me. And, 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 and he rose again and he sits on the right hand of his father. After his anguish, he will see the light and be satisfied. This refers to the fact that God the Father raised God the Son from the dead. Just like Jesus stopped funerals along the side of the road, just like Jesus told Lazarus, hey, Lazarus, Come on out of there. It's time to get up. It, 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 and the father showed that just like my son can do it, I gave him the power to do it, so I'm going to raise my son so you know that I am his father. You can't stop me from raising my son like you couldn't stop my son from raising those people. Now recognize that I am that I am. I am the one that parted the Red Sea and brought you across. I am the one that gave you manna when you were hungry. I am the one that sent you to Babylon for disobedience. And I am the one that released you from Babylon when your time was served. I am the one that sacrificed myself. I separated myself and sacrificed myself to satisfy myself that you may be free. 
I am that I am. Therefore, God will give him the many as a portion and receive the mighty as a sport. Exalted the son in the place of supremacy, seating him on the right hand in heaven. We've all heard the saying, my right hand man. When somebody is your right hand, that's somebody you can depend on. That's somebody, if you got a nickel, they got four and a half cents. That's somebody that has whatever it is that you have. There's no question about who they are. That's my right hand. I don't go nowhere without my right hand. I don't do nothing without my right hand. Whatever my right hand desires, I, they can have it. Because that's my right hand. And all those that trust in Jesus will be seated with him with access to his spiritual blessings. Now, we may not be the absolute right hand of Jesus. But if we believe and we trust in him, we have access. But because we know the right-hand man, because we have a relationship with the right-hand man, he can co-sign for us. That's why we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is a co-signment. In other words, Jesus vouches for you. He speaks up on your behalf. He speaks up on my behalf. When, when the accuser is before the Father, Jesus said, oh, hold on. I know that. He good people. He belong to me. And the accuser has to back off because he has to recognize the blood. So let's look at verses 52, 52, 14, and 15. What reaction do many people have to the servant and why? Astonished, yeah. Why were they astonished? Why were they astonished? Mesmerized, couldn't believe their eyes. Why? Couldn't believe it. He was beaten, he was wounded, beaten behind human recognition. So, what will happen to the servant and to the nations? Behold, my servant shall act wisely, and he shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. What, what, what will happen? What's going to happen?
shall be dealt with prudently. Amen. Amen. In 52.10, we are told that the Lord is going to lay bare his holy arm, that is, roll up his sleeves to save his people. But when he does so, what sort of person is revealed? Look in verses 53, 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3, defended by Jesus. Amen. The Savior, all right. What else? We reveal the Savior, but how is he described? Where did he come from? What did he look like? Holy, okay. What about um, with no form, no majesty, no beauty? A man of sorrow, acquainted with guilt or grief. Do we find those in verses 1 through 3? Who has believed, who has believed what has been heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Yes, sir, he did not open his mouth. He never said, he never said a mumbling word. Y'all know what the sequel is, right? That's the next movie. Now, what will be the result of the servant's suffering? What's the sequel? What's coming? What's coming?
Salvation for all that believe. Amen. He's coming. Yep. Coming back for his church. Amen. Amen. So then we talk about the millennium, the millennium kingdom, what he's going to rule. Having that been a discussion, everlasting life. Amen. Everlasting love. Amen. Amen. Got it. All right. Now, this is very personal. What for you are the most striking ties between this property and the experience of our Lord Jesus Christ? What stands out for you?
she <laughs> suffer for our mistakes. All right. So, First Peter four. To this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you may follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in His mouth. When He was reviled, He did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but continued entrusting Himself to Him who judged justly. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of our souls. 1 Peter 2.1 1 Peter 2.21 What are the parallels between that and that, uh, that what we read? The sheep, what else? What else? What was he trying to give us? What did he use Christ as? Atoning sacrifice as a sacrifice, okay. He took our punishment. All right, good. All that's true. Yes, we are easily led astray just like sheep. But he used that letter to set an example of what is expected of us. So, suggest reasons why the... the um, Isaiah 53, 5 is called the burning heart of the Old Testament, indeed, the, of the whole Bible. 53, 5 reads, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, with his wounds we are healed. To show the word is true. All right. That's personal. Burning heart. This goes back to the beginning of what we were talking about. The, brother, the, the starving mother that breastfeeds her child. The priest that gave up his life for somebody else to live. That's making the ultimate sacrifice. It has to be in your heart to make that ultimate sacrifice. If you don't care about somebody, you're not going to lay down your life on them. I don't care who you are. 
If you don't love that person, you're not going to lay down your life for them. You will find reasons to justify them dying before you lay down your life. Well, they ought to know better than do that. That just didn't make no sense. What's wrong with people today? Why are they doing this stupid stuff? Now, if it was somebody that you truly love, you would get between them and whatever's coming at them. And that's what Christ did. He got between us and the true wrath of God. Look at how he's described. Now I want you to look at yourself in the mirror when you get a chance. And think about having a crown of thorns pressed in your head. Taking 39 lashes. Somebody driving nails through your wrists. And you know how bad it feels when you accidentally stick yourself with a needle or a pin. And having someone drive a spike through your feet. If you ever stepped on a nail outside, you know how bad that feels. You ain't even got to step on a nail if you ever stepped on a tack. But you had somebody drive something into you. And if you've ever been bitten by the wrong bug, you know how bad it feels. So just imagine somebody taking a spear and piercing your side. Now, with that said, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to how he took that crown of thorn on his head? How he took them 39 lashes? How he drug that heavy cross up the hill? How he took being spit on? How he took being hated? for loving somebody. If you've ever been in a relationship and you've given 60 and they gave 40, you know it hurts you. And sometimes if you were the one giving, you the one giving 40 and they giving 60, you're still mad because you feel like they ought to give, them, they ought to give 99 and you give one or they ought to give 100 and you just take it off. Amen. We all need to be forgiven. So just, just imagine that. That crown of thorns in your head. By serving him every day. Amen. Amen. So that wraps up this lesson. But on that last, that last part. You ought to be able to shout for joy. That's our next lesson. <laughs> Isaiah 54, 55. You ought to be able to shout for joy, knowing that he took everything that we're supposed to take. Wednesday night. Y'all better come ready to shout for joy. Broken heart. All right. Uh, Pastor, do you have anything? That wraps up this lesson tonight. I hope that uh, you all got as much out of it as I did. I thank you for your participation. Each and every day that we meet, I grow stronger in the Lord. Y'all make me study. Y'all make me get closer. And I thank you. Y'all make me pray. And the Lord speaks through me and removes me. And this way, we grow closer to him. Well, Sister Allen, if you enjoyed it, come on back Wednesday. We're here every Monday and Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Yes, Jason.
I got the family covered. I saw it earlier. We'll pray for him. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. Any other prayer requests? We'll be praying for Larry's family tonight, the Weeks family. We'll be praying for everybody that works there. Any other requests? Amen. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Most High God, mm -hmm. we thank you for the opportunity to come before you. Father, we thank you for opening our hearts and our minds. Father, we thank you for speaking to me, speaking through me, touching my heart, touching our souls, blessing us this evening, Father. Now, Father, we pray for peace for the Weeks family, Lord. We pray for peace for the employees at the exotic farm. Let them be at peace and understanding that you are who you say you are and that you do what you say you can do. And all things work to the good of those who love you. Father, we just ask you to give them peace this evening, understanding. And let joy be in their hearts, knowing that this is a new beginning. This opened the door for something brand new to come in. In order for there to be life, Father, we know that has, something has to die. Father, we, now we ask that you bless the life that is coming in to that family. We ask you to bless the life that is coming into that organization. That it will be productive and it will do your will. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Good night, all.